All right, well, it's 5.30. Uh, good evening again. Thank you all for joining us for tonight's virtual teaching. Oops. Lindsay, you're on mute. I am on mute. Let's, let's run it back. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for standing by. It's 5.30. I hope you can now hear me. And as I was saying, thank you all for joining us for tonight's virtual teaching entitled Statehood and Criminal Justice Reform, How DC Can End an Era of Mass Incarceration. My name is Lindsay Morton and I serve as the Director of Community Engagement at the Office of the Attorney General for the District of Columbia. I have the pleasure again of opening our virtual doors and inviting you to listen to what is a really important conversation tonight. But before I start, I want to recognize and appreciate the incredible partners who have collaborated with our office to produce this evening's conversation. And they include the, the Office of Council Member Charles Allen, Rob Barton and Pam Bailey of More Than Our Crimes, Justice Policy Institute, the Campaign for Fair Sentencing of Youth, and Georgetown University. Uh, thank you all to our partners. Uh, you've been incredible to work with. Uh, and with that, I'm going to now introduce uh, one of the hardest working public servants I happen to know and work for, the District's Attorney General, Mr. Carl A. Racine. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for uh, that kind introduction. Um, and I'm thrilled to be uh, on this panel uh, and to hopefully advance uh, some good and uh, thought-provoking ideas that will push uh, the elected officials, that's me, and my great friend, the Judiciary Chairman, Charles Allen, um, and then perhaps get even more action, uh, action that will benefit the District of Columbia, action that will allow for a greater opportunity uh, for men and women in the District of Columbia. The idea for this panel uh, came from a longtime old friend of mine and a friend to many of this panel, and that's Rob Barton. I first met Rob and his mother, oh, nearly 25 years ago um, in the District of Columbia uh, when I was um, fortunately assigned uh, to be Rob's lawyer. Um, when you met Rob at that time, clearly wowed by his intellect and internal goodness, um, which obviously uh, derived from the strength and resilience of his mother. What was also very clear was that Rob was in the battle for his life as the outside forces, the street, as we oftentimes like to call it, uh, was really luring uh, Rob and uh, waging a battle for his attention uh, and his mind. Unfortunately, as is the case with too many young people in the District of Columbia, Rob lost that battle. Uh, the streets won out um, and, uh, and Rob today is incarcerated um, as an adult, um, not in his hometown of the District of Columbia, unfortunately, um, but in route eventually uh, to Florida. And so today's panel is an opportunity to really bring life to what Robert wanted, which was for us to have a conversation about mass incarceration, um, the criminal justice system, and the District of Columbia and how the District of Columbia can continue to show the way uh, and break the cycle of mass incarceration and trauma, uh, that incarceration and overpunishment and lack of services um, produces in the District of Columbia and in communities of color throughout the country. You see, we live in a world, and I'll include DC here, where it's all too often too easy to focus on perceptions of safety and security. Let me give you an example. Um, in the district public schools, there's uh, just one counselor or one psychologist to every 400 students. But for every 129 students, there's a security officer. So we've made a policy decision that kids we know who are coming to school every single day, suffering from trauma, are not going to get the kind of counseling services that their trauma requires, the kind of services that can be life altering, 
and certainly the kind of services that can help a young person focus their energies on school, um, positive activities, uh, and the like, um, as opposed to falling um, victim to the streets. It's these judgments that lawmakers and elected officials like myself um, have made you know, over decades. Um, and it's really caused our system to be totally imbalanced. At the Office of Attorney General, we primarily prosecute uh, young people. We're the exclusive prosecutor for juveniles in the District of Columbia, and we have some jurisdiction over misdemeanor offenses uh, in uh, the adult space. So what we've tried to do uh, with the help and support of legislators, most especially, again, Charles Allen in the District of Columbia, is to change the way in which the juvenile prosecutors prosecute. And that's why we partnered uh, with uh, administration officials at the Department of Human Services to really um, turbo boost uh, what was a diversion program before we got here in 2015 into an extraordinary program that seeks to take kids and not bring them into the criminal justice system. It seeks instead to focus on the underlying issues that may have contributed to their coming into the system that will, left unattended, have an impact on whether they come back into the system as older kids or as adults. And everybody that knows the diversion program that the Department of Human Services runs under the very able leadership of, uh, of, uh, of the team there knows that kids who go into that program normally do not come back into the juvenile justice system. And so it's programs like that ACE diversion program that need to be invested in even more greatly. In addition, at the Office of Attorney General, we've, we've tried to change the approach of prosecution and we brought in restorative justice uh, into the juvenile space where we've brought in victims of crime to come and to confront and to have a conversation uh, with individuals who you know, may have hurt them. And what we found through restorative justice, again, is that the restorative justice process is an alternative to the traditional prosecution process that not only allows for an opportunity for humanizing of the offender as well as understanding as to how the victim has been hurt, but it also is yet another attempt to heal the community in a way that, that, um, that diminishes the need for mass incarceration. And so we find ourselves here at a crossroads where we want to do more uh, progressive criminal justice reform that focuses on giving people the services and skills they need in order to be law-abiding assets in the District of Columbia. And so I look forward very much to participating on this panel um, and certainly look forward to our moderator, Mark Schindler, who's got just an extraordinary background and bringing people together and pushing for reform. Um, and so I've got my pen, I've got paper, I'm looking forward to learning. With that, I turn it over to Mark and I look forward to participating on my turn. Thank you, AG. Uh, we'll now hear from Mark Howard via video. Mark is the Professor of Government and Law and the founding director of the Prisons and Justice Initiative at Georgetown University. Uh, again, Mark is joining us by video, so please stand by for his remarks. Hi, my name is Mark Howard. I'm a professor of government and law at Georgetown University, and I direct the Prisons and Justice Initiative there. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you live this evening, but I'm six time zones ahead. And so I wanted to send this pre-recorded message. As you may know, 
At Georgetown, we run the Prison Scholars Program at the DC Jail, where we offer credit-bearing courses to incarcerated students. One of those students is Rob Barton. Rob Barton is the inspiration and the organizer of this event. Unfortunately, Rob couldn't be with us himself this evening because he has unfortunately been transported away from the DC jail and is on his way to a federal facility in Florida. And unfortunately, Rob's situation is fairly typical for incarcerated residents from DC and there are over 8,000 of them and over 90% are African-American. And they enter a dysfunctional world when they leave the DC jail. Since DC doesn't have its own prison, aside from the jail, which houses about uh, 1,500 or so residents, and they're mainly um, pre-trial um, or back on a new issue in their case, they eventually get handed over to the federal system where they're subjected to some of the worst conditions imaginable. They're stuck in federal prisons that are notorious for warehousing with few educational and programmatic opportunities. They're forced to live far from home, getting few visits from their loved ones. And they get transferred all around the country. And they're constantly being moved. Some people call it diesel therapy. Plus, in 2000, federal parole was abolished and DC residents are under the control of the US Parole Commission. Even now, after the passage of the First Step Act, it's still unclear whether DC residents get their good time credits counted and how much. The situation for DC incarcerated residents has been dismal for decades, but fortunately that's changing. And I wanna highlight three positive developments. First, the DC council has demonstrated tremendous leadership by passing and hopefully soon expanding the Incarceration Reduction Amendment Act or IRAA, IRA. Second, Attorney General Racine has helped to reimagine and redefine the role of a prosecutor who actually works with and not against his constituents. And third, the Department of Corrections leadership in DC under Director Quincy Booth has been extremely supportive of new and pathbreaking programs within the DC jail, including Georgetown's mixed gender credit bearing program that also holds classes that combine inside and outside students. That's really a leader in this field. These are very good signs, but we need to keep the momentum going forward. And this forum tonight presents an opportunity to keep the ball moving while highlighting the ideas and voices of the incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. I'm sorry that I can't join you live, but I know you'll have a great conversation. And I hope you can honor the vision and leadership of Rob Barton tonight, who's an extraordinary student. And I know that Roy, and his nickname is 4.0 Middleton, is going to represent Rob well. They're two remarkable individuals. They're two of the best students that I've ever had. And they represent the power and they embody how prison education can change people's lives. So I hope you enjoy the event tonight. Thank you for having me from a distance. Thank you so much, Professor Howard. And not to confuse you guys, but I'm gonna turn the event over now to another Mark, Mark Schindler, who serves as the Executive Director of the Justice Policy Institute. Mark is tonight's moderator and is gonna reintroduce and introduce you to all of our panelists and get our conversation going. Mark? Thank you so much, Lindsay. And uh, thank you, Attorney General Racine and Mark Howard for those comments as well. I think it really uh, sets, sets the table well for the conversation uh, in this moment. And, you know, you two have both uh, recognized Rob's vision. And I'll, I'll just add to that. We're here today because of his vision. Uh, unfortunately, he, he couldn't be with us, but he was completely insistent uh, that the program go on in his absence. He stayed in touch. Uh, he continues to write. You'll hear more about his work. Uh, towards the end of the program and also uh, maybe a little bit surprised uh, that, that he can share with us um, about his work going forward. So um, Rob's vision was to have this conversation around a number of issues in the district. And we've got, as you can see, a really amazing panel with the Attorney General, with Council Member Charles Allen, uh, Crystal Carpenter, from the Campaign for Fair Sentencing of Youth and, and Roy Middleton, who's with the Center for Education and Alternatives 
uh, in educational settings. But because Rob's network is wide, uh, he also felt strongly that there were others who he wanted as part of this conversation. Uh, in fact, he had many others who we wanted to uh, include, uh, but because we only have a certain amount of time, we, we had to limit it. And so Rob felt strongly that he wanted to include in the conversation some special guests. Uh, so Keisha Robinson has joined us uh, from the Public Defender Service. Uh, she also serves as co-chair of the uh, Reentry Action Network. Uh, tonight, she's wearing her attorney hat uh, from PDS. Um, James Dunn has joined us. Uh, James also is a, a partner and colleague of Rob's and has his own uh, story and experiences to share that relate to these important issues. And then finally, Marcy Mistret, uh, the CEO of the Campaign for Youth Justice, has joined us. Uh, to talk about their work and where DC fits in, particularly on the issue of young people uh, prosecuted in the adult criminal justice system. So we've got uh, really a, a, an amazing group of folks today, uh, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. The way we're going to frame this, and as, as the Attorney General noted at the beginning, is in the context of district, the district being a unique jurisdiction in the country. Uh, and the issues of home rule and how uh, Congress and the federal government uh, exert their influence and control of, over our justice system. And we're seeing that uh, the, a prime example in the fact that Rob is not here uh, with us. That was not a decision that anybody within the local criminal justice system made. Uh, there was no understanding at all uh, of, of his role in this community uh, and what it would mean not to have him here. So that's I, I couldn't think of a better example. Um, so we'll talk about those three issues uh, this evening and we'll think about how we can do better moving forward. So with that, let's, let's kick it off. And I'm gonna uh, go back to, to the Attorney General um, and, and ask you to just share, share your thoughts a little bit more as we think about the district's uh, unique status under, under Home Rule, under the Revitalization Act. And, and from your perspective, which is a really um, unique position. The, the first elected attorney general uh, of the district, uh, one I'm happy to say that I voted for. Um, I can also say that I did not vote for the attorney general and his department who made decisions to have Rob Barton sent uh, far away from the country. Um, you also served as a, a public defender in DC and, and as in the private legal community. So share a little bit more about how these issues play out from your perspective um, as we think particularly about these issues of parole, uh, of not having our own prison, um, and, and kids in the adult system? Sure. Um, let me uh, take that from uh, the end first. Um, because uh, D.C. is not a state, uh, because the federal government has the criminal, the vast criminal authority over adults, um, we find ourselves in a system as well where kids, young people, um, certainly the age of 16 and 17, who are charged with certain offenses to include serious offenses, you know, murder, assault with intent to kill, uh, and other serious offenses, um, are deemed under the definition of child to be adults. And they're deemed to be adults, not by a court that is expert in neuroscience, not by a locally elected prosecutor who can be held accountable uh, by the residents of the District of Columbia, but instead are determined to be an adult for charging purposes by the United States Attorney's Office in DC, which again, is completely unelected and certainly does not, as it currently is set up, um, you know, share uh, what I'll just generally call DC values. Um, and so that is a significant problem. Um, why is that a problem? It's a problem because you've got, uh, in the face of overwhelming science, even as recognized by a conservative United States Supreme Court, um, young people, Yes, even kids who commit serious offenses at age 16 or 17 are considered to be adults here. 
the science all tells us that young people are still under development. And that development brain-wise doesn't really occur in a final way until kids are 25, 26 years old. And so you throw in an adult system of crime and punishment, emphasis added on punishment, and then you've got a kid who may have made a tragic mistake, but all of a sudden isn't looking at a five or six year period of time where they're focused on rehab and education as they would be uh, in the juvenile system, but instead are being sentenced for upwards to decades of time in an adult system, which as Mark Schindler correctly stated, doesn't have a DC jail, which means that the community and family that are necessary for a young person to feel supported and to be able to get through the incarcerative experience in a positive way is not there. And so that um, is where I'll focus right away. And I think that that particular system is harsh, it's unfair, uh, and it's worthy of change. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking more about those kinds of right. changes. Great. Th thanks so much, uh, Attorney General uh, Racine. I think you, what really resonated with me, I mean, everything you said was just so spot on, but talking about DC values, right? That, that core, like, of our community. That's and, right. And I'm going to, with that, maybe I can turn to you, Councilmember Allen. Um, you know, Mark Howard alluded to the work that uh, the council has been doing. The Attorney General did as well. I mean, here we have two locally elected officials who are really uh, spearheading and I think, you know, viewed around the country as leaders on these issues, but obviously limited in scope because of the dynamic. One, one thing I'm, I'm interested to hear your perspective, council member, is in this moment that we're in right now, mm. with, with COVID, uh, with the pandemic we're dealing with, with the uh, post-George Floyd um, awareness that we're now seeing around the country, and of course, including the activities that we're seeing uh, here, here in the district. Um, the, the council has been quite busy, uh, and, and I think in many ways, in a good way. You, it was Mark Howard alluded to the emergency legislation um, that you passed, as well as previous legislation uh, under IRA. Um, in, in response to COVID, you passed uh, the expanded good time credits. Um, IRA looks at the developmental issues, and I know you're thinking about the second look as well. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit from your perspective as a, as a council member from the legislative branch, how, how you view this issue and the legislation that you have championed, uh, where do you see that in terms of DC values um, and best practices in, in justice reform? Yeah, um, well, thank you, Margaret. It's a lot there in that question, so I'll do my yeah. best. Um, <laughs> let me also say thanks and, uh, and a ditto to Carl and his comments there. Um, you know, we've got just an outstanding attorney general uh, here in the district and one that I'm very proud. Uh, to call a friend, but also proud that I get to vote for. Um, and that's just a fundamental part of our democracy that I think is important. Um, let me also thank Rob um, for, for bringing this together and, and helping make this happen. Uh, and for the folks that, that are out there that might be joining us tonight, um, and maybe maybe you're well-versed in these issues and you know every acronym we're saying, uh, maybe you're, you're not uh, and you're looking to learn something, um, Welcome to the conversation. And there's really actually a lot of ways, it can be an intimidating space, but there's a lot of ways to get involved in when we talk about statehood and criminal justice reform movements. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or frankly anybody on this panel um, that would be, I know everyone would be willing to find ways to, to help bring you into that. Um, and I'll be honest, that I, you know, to kind of help lay the groundwork for your question, I, I put myself in that category, you know, four years ago before I took over chairing this committee. Um, I certainly was not somebody who had a whole lot of experience uh, working on criminal justice issues. Um, I'd worked at the council, uh, been chief of staff to a former council member, I've been elected and served on the council for a while, but it really wasn't until I became the chair of this committee um, that I began to understand how incredibly complex the, the district's criminal justice systems are, and I'm gonna intentionally use systems, um, 
because they're so interrelated, they have so many failures, uh, and they are so harmed by our lack of statehood and autonomy, that they create a lot of the injustices that, that we are gonna talk about tonight. Um, I also think what's an important thing for a lot of people is to recognize how much power we all have, um, not just as legislators um, or advocates and activists, but really just as people within our community to, to recognize the humanity of others. Um, I, I know for myself, I, it, it is seared in my brain the very first time I ever went over to the DC jail. Uh, and I was meeting with and talking to um, several young men uh, and they were all uh, there under Title 16. This is prior to, to having our Title 16 young people move over to DYRS. But um, I, it was eye-opening for me. Um, it was empowering for me. I, they brought me to talk, but frankly, I learned much more uh, than certainly anything I imparted uh, in that day. But, but it was recognizing just the humanity of people. And as I got to meet and work with a lot of the men in the YME program over the DC jail, um, getting to know people on an individual level, you see the human capacity, the human potential, um, and, and it really hones that. It's, in this space, it's very easy to, to just treat a group of people as others, um, and, and it's really so powerful to recognize the humanity, not just of that individual, but then, of course, their family, their neighborhood, their community that just circles out. Um, so I'm really proud of the work we've done uh, with IRA, which is, again, Mark Howard talked about that. We've also expanded that already once, and then we're looking to do the, what we call the Second Look Act, uh, which is a further expansion of that. And it really works to get at um, fundamentally changing many of the harms of uh, just punitive, um, in many cases, uh, clearly racially based uh, sentences that, that have harmed young people and, and have harmed our city, frankly. Um, but I'm going to talk just briefly about one of the efforts, uh, and you alluded to this, Mark, about what we're doing in the, in the face of COVID. So certainly, uh, early in the spring, we were trying to understand the profound effects of COVID and what that would have an impact on our criminal justice system. And trying to think some very serious legislative decisions very quickly. Um, namely, how do we reduce our incarcerated population and at the same time keep an eye on public safety and health? So we decided to explore a legislative reform around our good time credits. So essentially, for folks who aren't as familiar with this, it means time off of your sentence for good behavior and participation in, in rehabilitative programming. So the idea is we want to help incentivize people who are incarcerated to participate in that type of positive programming with their time off, uh, their sentence. Because the data tells us we know that people are less likely to reoffend if they're better prepared to reenter society ready to succeed. So the way we did this was in two, two ways. One that's worked well, and I'd say one that is still fairly stalled. Uh, first, for people that are incarcerated at the DC jail, so that's gonna largely be our misdemeanor convictions. Specifically, we gave the Department of Corrections more discretion to give good time credits, and that resulted in releases of many sentenced misdemeanors. And I think this went really well. Um, it's been a pretty big success. Uh, what's been more difficult, of course, is to have our good time credit reform for people sentenced for felonies. And they then are serving not just in our, not in our local system, but again, for folks that aren't as familiar with our system, they're out in our federal BOP, so we've lost control of them. Um, first off, the BOP has to identify who would be eligible for that reform, which shouldn't be, but is an administrative hurdle and burden. Um, then we have to go through the BOP's central administrative office, which has been deeply impacted by COVID. Uh, next, there's then calculations, individual cases, and if you're not currently represented by an attorney, it's actually really hard to argue with the BOP about how much time should come off of your sentence. And then for people sentenced during that time, uh, the time that relates to pre the year 2000, uh, they've been serving for a long time. And the recalculation has the potential to make them eligible for parole. And of course, then with the US Parole Commission, another federal agency that we're talking about tonight, uh, has to schedule a hearing for many, mostly men, uh, one at a time. So at the end of the day, several people have been released, often due to excellent representation by the Public Defender Service, but many, many more are awaiting their hearings. I think we have almost like 600 uh, so if there's any pro, bo pro bono attorneys out there, uh, certainly let us know. We'll, we can help connect you. Um, but, you know, as we talked about with Rob, um, he's not with us tonight because he's shipped back out into BOP as, um, as, as they're waiting to try to get to their hearing. So if we had local control, uh, and that to me is one of our big issues, when we talk about the fundamental uh, injustices around this system, if we had local control, it would be exponentially easier to implement the law, to hold agencies accountable for complying. And I think this is just one good example of how easily our local agency was able to actually implement a law 
uh, that I think has had very positive results and how difficult it's been with a federal agency. Um, and so I think if there's one takeaway, it's that we need full control of our system. Uh, I think it's one of the, the, the worst bargains the district ever made years and years ago. Um, and and we, have to, we have to bring control back. And, and I think that that will be a significant part of, not the only one, but it'll be a significant part of righting so many of the wrongs and, um, and just the, what I think is just structural racism that is just built into our criminal justice system. Uh, so I, I, I think that's uh, hopefully a, a big takeaway from our conversation tonight. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Councilmember Allen, and, and thank you again for your leadership and pushing these issues. Um, there, there was a number of things that you said there, both in terms of uh, the, the local control, particularly over like release decision making, uh, as well as your, your initial experience uh, at the jail talking to some of the, the title, young, title 16 young folks who were there, prosecutors, adults. I'm going to start um, maybe as we segue and talk a little bit about this issue of parole. Um, because that may be um, one of the areas of the system where the district may be closest in some ways to taking some of this uh, control back. And if, if you could, uh, Keisha, I'm, I'm going to go to you quickly. Um, and if you could just share with us um, uh, a little bit, uh, for folks who, who don't know, uh, Councilmember Allen and, and the Attorney General referred to a little bit, say a little bit more about how it works currently. Uh, for folks who uh, are eligible for parole. We know that's not everybody in the district because changes in the law. Uh, so if you could say a little bit about that. And, and then um, we'll, we'll ask James to share a little bit of his personal experience uh, with, the, with the parole system uh, here. So Keisha, if you could start us off and with your PDS hat, give, give us a little bit of a, a quick primer on how it works here and any thoughts you have on how it should work. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to Rob, who helped organize this. I was really sad to hear he couldn't be here um, after he would call me <laughs> weekly on my phone to make sure I was prepared for this. Um, but in any event, I'm glad that I'm here to talk about parole. And I cannot agree more with Councilmember Allen that we need local control of parole. Parole was designed to get people out of prison early. Um, but in fact, it's become a driver of mass incarceration, specifically here in the district. Um, and that horrible bargain that the council member talked about is the Revitalization Act, um, which occurred at this point um, almost 20 years ago, which gave the United States Parole Commission authority and jurisdiction to consider parole for folks that have been convicted of DC code offenses before year 2000. The way it currently works is that United States parole hearing examiners conduct parole hearings where people come before them who are eligible and they, by statute, are supposed to consider three things. One, whether the person can be out in the community and not violate the law. Two, whether the, that release is compatible with society. And three, whether they've served their minimum term. Now, what do I mean by minimum term? Under the old, what they call indeterminate um, system, which are offenses before 2000, people got ranges of time. A sentence may look like five to 15 years, 20 to life, for example. And in determining whether that person should be paroled, the hearing examiner is supposed to consider several factors. Things like whether or not they participated in programming, whether or not that programming bears on their rehabilitation, whether or not they've taken responsibility, whether or not they've expressed remorse, and they also consider the seriousness of offense. Now, of those factors I just mentioned, which one is immutable? Which one cannot be changed? The seriousness of the offense. Everything else, the prisoner, has control over, right? They can participate in programming. They can do everything in their power to demonstrate to the parole commission, look, I will not violate once released in the community. You can trust me to be in society. Look at all these things I've done. Look how I'm ready. Look how I'm rehabilitated. But what we find after representing in my shop hundreds of people um, before the parole commission and parole grant hearings, revocation hearings and early termination hearings is that the hearing examiners have wide unchecked discretion. 
and they take all those things that the prisoner has control over, put it to the side and say, we wanna focus on the offense. We wanna focus on the seriousness of the offense that happened 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago. The one thing you cannot change. And what we find is that they substitute their judgment for the judgment of the judge. And why is that a problem? Because people who were convicted of these offenses, whether they were convicted by a jury of their peers or whether they pled, they truly believed, if I do everything right, I'm incentivized to comply with the institution and do everything right, then I should have a high chance of release under the law. But that's not what happens. And they get essentially resentenced or what is called set-offs, two-year set-off, three-year set-off, five-year set-offs. I can't tell you the amount of clients who say, this is it. If I get out this time, I can make my baby girl's graduation, her eighth grade graduation. Well, guess what? When they get that four-year set off, now they're hoping to make her high school graduation. And then they get another set off. It is devastating. It is devastating to our clients and it's devastating to us who represents them. But we have an opportunity now thanks to the leadership of the mayor, the leadership of the council, the leadership of the AG, to create a new system, a new parole system that brings local control, a new system that envisions new policy guidelines, which are designed by the DC Council, a new system that says, look, this is like sentencing, parole, more and more, um, uh, um, more and more people are identifying parole as essentially an extension of sentencing, saying that folks should be entitled to constitutional due process. And so we envision a system where folks are given lawyers to represent them and that, and PDS feels strongly that this system should have judges, um, local DC judges, the local judges that are in DC Superior Court to weigh evidence, to look at the rehabilitation, judges who can consistently and fairly interpret the statutory guidelines and can apply them to get to protect people's due process rights and protect their liberty interests. Um, we envision a system where we do not create a new local board of parole because that's just essentially creating another criminal justice system that will be incentivized, motivated to, and have an impetus to incarcerate black and brown people. There is no way around that. It will want to increase its own survival. And every parole system in the country has demonstrated that. Also, we feel like a local board of parole would be subject to political wins. And we're hoping to protect our clients and people seeking release by giving them due process, by giving them legal representation and affording them decision-making by judges. Great, Th thank you so much, Keisha. I mean, there's a lot there. And, and what you're talking about is having the decision making made locally. Um, there's a process that probably the district will, will, will go through, Council Member Allen and others, to decide whether that's the court, a, a local parole board, others uh, who, who can weigh in on that. But essentially what you're saying is we also have to get away from having just this, the nature of the offense, which never will change, to be the driving factor is what I'm hearing from you. Um, at least one of the one of the critical points. I think that that's probably a good segue because I'm guessing, James, uh, as as you were listening to that, um, that probably sounds a little bit, uh, or maybe more than just a little bit, about your experience um, that that Keisha was describing. So I'm wondering if you could if you could quickly. I'm going to ask everyone to to try to keep your comments relatively short. But James, share a little bit with us your experience and and your perspective on this issue of of uh, parole and what folks do uh, while they're incarcerated and whether that's recognized or not in, in their efforts to, to earn and achieve their freedom? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm a prime example of uh, what was just spoken about pertaining to the parole board. I was a juvenile when I committed my crime. I was brought into the BOP system. Uh, I was sentenced to 15 in life with a five-year mandatory minimum, meaning uh, 10 years of my sentence wasn't mandatory. So I was sentenced under what was called the Good Time Credit Act, where we could receive uh, up to 10 days a month off our sentence for programming, 
And I was told by my judge, my lawyer, that if I went in there and did what I was supposed to do and program and educate myself, that I would be able to uh, receive parole. And uh, from day one, when I came into BOP, I started on that journey uh, in an environment where it's so easy to get caught up and catch uh, write-ups and shots, as they call them, for uh, disciplinary infractions. Uh, I worked hard to stay clear from all of that. Um, I did. I first became eligible for parole. I, I came. I committed my crime in 1989. I became eligible for parole in 2010. And at that time, I didn't have any infractions. I had superior programming. I had completed every program that they had put before me. And uh, my, that was my initial parole hearing. And uh, I was recommended for parole by the examiner, but it came back denied. I was given a three year set off as they talked about. Um, I came back up for parole three years later. I had continued the program, no infractions. I didn't have any infractions in over 20 plus years. Um, I came back up this time. And this time I was given a five year set off for no apparent reason other than what was stated in my initial parole hearing, um, which was devastating to say the least, because like I said, I had taken every program, I had got superior program, I had been recognized for superior programming. Um, and I just was devastated. I didn't know what to do. It was really nothing else for me to do as far as programming was concerned to show who I was today opposed to who I was when I was 16 years old. Um, so I did the five year set off. I came back up after that, continued the program, became an, a teacher in education. I was teaching adult continuing education classes for over five years. And when I seen the parole again, they denied my parole again and gave me another three year set off. So I was given uh, over 11 years in set offs, which is another sentence um, for no apparent reason other than the initial crime as being the reason why uh, I was denied parole and nothing that I did while I was incarcerated uh, changed their view. Um, so I'm, I'm an hour recipient, uh, recipient and uh, I'm just so grateful for that, that law because uh, when I went before the judge, the judge looked at my jacket and and saw everything that I had participated in, all the support I had gotten over the years, all the letters that were written for me on my behalf by BOP staff. And uh, she stated that I should have been released 10, 11 years ago. So um, it just shows how flawed the system is. Yeah. Um, it's, it's greatly flawed. I mean, I, you got guys in there who are doing, working extremely hard who have changed, who are doing everything that they could possibly do to show these people that they have changed. And it's just like, like all of the educational good days that I earned while I was in, it didn't mean anything. It was like, it was just washed away. So um, I'm just here to, to speak on that aspect of the parole board and, and how it's flawed and how uh, I believe that DC does need to take that power back because uh, our views or our, uh, futures are not being taken into consideration from a, a, a Washington DC uh, perspective. You know, we're in yeah. Oklahoma or California or right. Florida and we've seen, you know, these parole boards. So yeah. I just pray that, you know, this, this forum helps uh, change a flawed system. Well, thank you so much, James, for, for being here. Uh, with us and sharing your perspective and and for just continuing uh, to to do everything you could you you did the right thing I, it doesn 't sound like anything changed really between uh, the parole board decision denial and the judge here in your case. you continued to do what you were supposed to do and in many ways, your resilience, your hard work, your commitment uh, to me speaks of what the attorney general said, those are all DC values, right? That's what we want all of our citizens to do uh, and to live by, and you did. Uh, and so I'm just grateful that you're here today, uh, that you could join us. 
Um, I, I want to keep the conversation going and, and maybe bring you in now, Roy. Um, it, from what I'm hearing, something uh, you and James and Rob Hall had in common is that you all went to prison, went to jail when you were under the age of 18. Uh, what we refer to in the district and has been, been talked about is the Title 16. Um, in fact, it sounds like if it was about 25 years ago when Councilmember Allen, if you had gone over to the jail and talked to the Title 16 uh, group of young people, you might have been sitting there with Roy and with James and with Rob. Um, so Roy, you, you had your experience going in as a very young person. Um, I want to just share a little bit, uh, if you can, and you know, a little bit of time, what, what that experience was like for you. Um, going in so young and, and how that played out for you over the years. Um, I can only imagine that the fact that you're here today means that you not only survived and thrived, but my guess is that the system wasn't necessarily the reason that you thrived. So if you could share a little bit, that would be great. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Mark, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a difficult experience, man, again, um, I know primarily initially being housed around adults um, as a child, right? At, at, in that moment where I made a horrible mistake, um, kind of that veritable fork in the road to an extent, um, you know, we was forced to be housed around um, more or less, more or less adults without any, any real safeguards, um, more protections in place. Um, again, to, to, to keep individuals protected, the most, obviously the most vulnerable population um, within the jail. Um, and I guess for me, it kind of it kind of forced me to take more or less an unnatural leap in the sense that, again, in that moment where you could, um, with again that vertical fork in the road, it just kind of reaffirmed being around, being in that situation, that environment kind of just reaffirmed um, and reinforced again the same the same attitudes and the same bad habits that is the reason why I found myself in the situation I was in. Um, and so, you know, and, you know, engaging with your peers, fellow 16, 17 year olds, um, and engaging with adults was just totally different, um, in regards just to the, you know, to the level of the level, the level of the level of violence, the level of manipulation, the level of predation. Um, you know, you're aware how vulnerable you are physically or otherwise, um, you know, it kind of, it kind of creates a, a, you know, a hypervigilance, um, that isn't healthy or conducive to growth period um and it's just again it, it just it kind of it, it can be it can be a long winding road that some people unfortunately can never get off of right fortunately for me by the grace of god um i was i was fortunate enough to kind of mature to have time and space within myself um to mature in prison um and to realize that um again that to have the faith faith as well and realize that um that my life wasn't over even though i had received the life sentence um, and that, that enabled me to kind of see, kind of see the future or, or work towards the future that wasn't immediately, um, recognizable, um, to me or anyone else. Um, and so just through the years, as difficult as it was, as difficult as it was in the fairs, we was in the fairs for 20 years, which for DC prisons is, is more or less the worst. Um, you know, just because we just treated so unfairly in a sense, you know, we got to work our way up from like most people. They 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 custody system and class class how they classify is just always difficult for us because of our indeterminate sentences, which relates to the parole board and all those other things. We just have life in their eyes, so we don't get the programs, we don't get anything. Um, and you got to kind of you got to manage, you got to scrape and, and and scrap for everything that you get, every program you get to try to prepare yourself um for reentry to society. So, um, you know, again, I just I attribute it to God, man, to all uh, grace, the grace, um, all the grace and the glory to God, um. As to, why, as to how I made it, in addition to just, again, these having the DC spirit, having individuals in the feds together who all collectively make an effort um, to, to, to pull each other up um, and to help and to work on each other cases and to do all these things um, that is conducive, that, that has enabled us to kind of arrive at this point that we at today. So, um, Again, man, it's, it's just an honor. It's an honor to be here. It's a blessing. I'm having spent 25 years of my life in prison to be here, to be working, to be with this esteemed um, panel right here, um, and to just be, a, be able to have a voice and to be able to have some input um, moving forward. Well, th th thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be on a, 
uh, to moderate a panel with you, uh, that's for sure. C can you say quickly, Roy, before I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to Crystal to get her thoughts, can you say quickly, let folks know what you're doing now. Um, I work for um, the Center for Educational Excellence um, in Alternative Settings. It's a nonprofit um, who pri who's primarily about um, creating, creating, creating better educational opportunities um, for, for juveniles and for individuals who find themselves in, in, in those institutions in, in those settings. Um, doing tremendous work. Um, it's, it's impactful work. It's work that, that I feel like I'm not even working in a sense. Um, because I because of I know I know how I was and I know the situation when I was in I didn't even when I was in the jail they didn't we didn't have to go they didn't make us go to school we couldn't go to school in fact and so that played a key role off also as well as moving forward um as far as an individual again just growth um the kind of, I, I believe that it's done individual growth because education is important right that's great well the, thank you for your work and clearly I mean you are such an exhibit for uh, the value of education. You know, we heard Professor Howard talking about uh, your, you know, one of the most outstanding students he's ever had. Uh, and that's the best of the best, right? Georgetown University. So uh, I don't know if we say uh, Hoya Saxa or uh, Hoya, I guess Saxa. Hoya Saxa. All right. Um, well, thanks so much for being here and your continued work. Um, you know, Crystal, let's bring you into the conversation. You're an expert on so many of these issues. Um, from uh, IRA and Second Look and Reentry. Um, you also have a perspective, a uh, personal perspective uh, on this, including uh, young people going into the system when they were uh, uh, under the age of 18. So share a little bit, Crystal, um, of your perspective and how you see these issues and, and what you think we should be pointing towards moving forward. Thanks, um, Mark, for the question. I, um, my perspective, well, first I want to say, I want to thank Rob for this amazing event, right? Um, I regard Rob as a brother of mine. I'm just so proud of him and I have been able to see his potential as a child, um, facing a lengthy sentence more than two decades ago and to see how he has transitioned and matured into the wonderful man he is today is just amazing. Um, my perspective is based on my proximity to this issue. Um, my brother, James, was 17 years old when he was arrested in Washington, D.C. Um, it was in the spring of 1996, and I, I will um, first acknowledge that the landscape then was a bit different, to say the least. Um, he's my older brother, uh, without me telling my age, <laughs> but <laughs> so back at that time, he seemed so much bigger than me, right? Um, but when I look back at pictures of him and others that were sentenced during that time, um, coupled with the fact that I now have a 16-year-old son, I'm able to see more clearly the little scrawny kid that sat over at the jail uh, 24 years ago. Um, at that young age, I remember visiting him as he was being housed um, at the juvenile block in the D.C. jail. When I would visit, guards would bring him out, fully shackled, with a belly chain on. And one of the most vivid memories I have at that time that I just cannot get out of my head um, is coming to visit him for the first time and seeing him come outside. And they, have to, they used to have to sit in this cage of sorts, right? Because they were separated off because they was in a juvenile block. They would have their shackles on and they would, like I said, the belly chain on. Um, I remember the guard, when I visit ending, the guard grabbing my brother James by his hands and him and tightening the, the handcuffs at that time. And because his arms were so small, because he's just a child, he had to tighten them as much as he can. My brother winced. And I remember tears just started falling down my face. Um, I just remember my brother looking at me and then immediately looking away because he didn't want to appear weak in that environment. Um, it is something that I think is forever etched in my mind. And a reason why I fight so hard to make sure that children across the country are treated fairly. Um, back then, to echo Roy's point, the juvenile block, you were charged as an adult. At that time, there was no programming, no schooling, no way to get a GED. You were simply being warehoused. Um, so that resulted in a lot of idle time, combined with the lack of maturity that we all have heard about, the brain science, which many will argue increased the violence in the places where they were housed and provided with the no, as they were provided with no hope or seeing no options available to them. 
Um, the schools became somewhat what many call a gladiator school where you would learn war tactics uh, from battling each other as opposed to learning algebra and geometry and English that you would expect people to um, learn during that time. But so when you see, see Roy and, and, and James Dunn and others and even Rob, um, and you have that backdrop, you get an understanding of what they had to battle with and they just make the story a little bit more um, hard to think about, right? Because you see, see, you witness them today. One of the biggest issues back then was the mechanism allowed prosecutors to indiscriminately charge these young people as adults. Um, there was no scalpel approach used. So when you think about Rob's story, um, you know, he was 16, he had no juvenile history. His mom sent him to some of the best schools in the area. Um, he was just a way where youth that got off track. Um, but he could have benefited from someone valuing and acknowledging that fact and that he was a child. Um, as I witness those, um, you, you reference me as an expert in these issues. <laughs> um, as I witnessed that in my fight for my brother and I got to know others that were suffering from these same things, I knew Rob's story. I knew, um, you know, Harleen Flowers, others that were incarcerated during this time. I began fighting for ways in which to get them, for other people to value them the way that I've seen um, over the years through corresponding with them. And um, in doing so, I came across an organization called the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth. Um, I reached out to this organization asking for some way to help us, like help us understand DC dynamics. They were procedurally barred from any opportunities for relief. Um, the campaign uh, and this wonderful woman who was senior policy counsel at the time, Nicola Natus, Mabel Juris, under the great leadership of Jody Kent Levy, um, uh, was ready, willing, and able to partner with myself as a family member of someone that was incarcerated. And that's how our came into play um, through various iterations of the bill, reviewing it, understanding what the guys were up against, just trying to make sure that it gave them a, a great opportunity to show judges what their potential was and what they were made of. Um, so I think that um, providing more opportunities where people are able to um, go before judges, um, like with Second Look, to expanding it to the emerging adult population where people are able to go before judges so you don't have to worry about this parole process as much as um, to, to Keisha's point um, would be ideal if I had to, you know, wave, wave a magic wand and, and hope something happen. Um, and I think just, just making sure that those that are coming home, you, you continuously see the potential in them um, and recognize that in different spaces. So that would be my recommendation. Well, th thank you, Crystal. Um, I've got Rob on my shoulder here right now telling me to like, keep folks going. Um, <laughs> I, know, I, know that, I know some of the folks have uh, a hard stop, but I, I'm going to do this quick. Marcy, if you can just, Crystal was, was referencing sort of DC how it works with the prosecutors. Can you just say quickly, Marcy, you, you have a national perspective on this. How are we different? Um, and, then, and then I'm gonna go quickly to Council Member Allen and then we're gonna hear from Rob himself uh, uh, before, before we close out. Great, I go, I'll go real quick and I, I dropped an article in the chat here because I wanna make sure to um, elevate Rob's voice because as everyone said, he was tireless and saying, we gotta, we gotta squeeze this in, we've gotta squeeze this in. Um, but I can say that, that D.C. is the only jurisdiction in the country, right, where a federal prosecutor makes the determination on what, on what child goes to the adult criminal justice system. And, you know, and, you know there's only 13 states at all that give the, the local prosecutor that much power. But we are definitely, definitely alone um, in, our, in our treatment. And, and I think one of the things that's really upsetting about that, other than the fact we don't get to uh, control what happens to our own children, and, and I'm talking, these are some of our most vulnerable children, right? For a lot of reasons. And, um, and obviously they do have, we've got lots of examples here with Roy and James and Rob um, that have told us why we need uh, to not do this. Yeah. But um, real quick, we're, DC also has no way for children to come back. Once you are charged as an adult in DC and you start, uh, in Superior Court, like we are with Florida and Michigan and Louisiana, uh, there is no way back. So if you plead to something 
much lower than that, if the facts didn't support the prosecutor's decision, there's no way back. And all of that is tied to uh, what Crystal and Keisha and um, Carl and, and Charles Allen have said tonight in terms of the tension between home rule uh, you know, and DC local folks. So it, it is still a big problem. And even though, you know, kids are not driving violence in DC and the numbers are going down and dropping, um, we still send four times or three times what any other state in the country does um, in terms of the number of kids we prosecute as so, adults. So, so yet, yet another example of how our system is unique, not in a good way. Uh, in terms of who's making decisions and the process. Um, thanks, Marcy, for sharing that perspective. Um, we, we could go on for, for, for hours with this group. It's so hard to, to limit the conversation. Um, the, the one other issue Rob asked us to, to at least touch on, and, and I'm gonna use this as a way to segue to him, um, but I'm gonna first ask Council Member Allen uh, to say quickly, you, you, myself, and, and the Attorney General all have the honor of serving on the DC Jails and Justice Task Force. Um, and one of the issues that the task force is, is wrestling with is what is the future in terms of a, a facility, a jail, or, a, a, and some decision about or discussion about trying to bring folks home. Can you give us just a, a quick update, Council Member, uh, of where we are on that? And I know you've got a, a pressing matter that, that you need to get to soon, but. If you can just give us that, and then I think we'll we'll go to Rob and uh, and we'll we'll close out the evening. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I mean, let me first and foremost say, um, you know, if you think about our, our current DC jail facility, um, it is is structurally inappropriate for incarcerated residents. It's half a century old. Uh, it was built at a time when we built jails to be cages for people. It's poorly designed to serve any goal of, of rehabilitation. Um, now that said, our, our Department of Corrections, I think, does an excellent job of working with what they've got, uh, which is a crumbling and, and building that's just not, not set up right, um, to come up with ways to offer quality programming, whether it's you know, Mark Howard and, and Georgetown, whether it's creating YME or Young Men Emerging or YME units um, that try to help set people up for success when they come home and in turn makes everything better. Uh, so I do wanna give them credit for having to kind of work with what they've got. Um, but I believe that we need to tear down uh, the current facility. So the question though is, so well, what do we do? What do we replace? Do we, do we build or replace? Is it a jail? Um, it's a very complex question. And, and I'm emphasizing those words, either building something, replacing something, or even using the term jail because there's a lot of underlying decisions and values that are in those words that we need to examine. What is it we want to create? Like, if we go through this process, it's only a once in, you know, once in a 50 year type of decision. So whatever decision we make, we're stuck with well past all of us. Uh, and it's gonna be at least another 50 years before you come back to reimagine it. And that's really why I created the Jails and Justice Task Force. Uh, it's an entity that's run through a grant that goes through the Council for Court Excellence. And it pulls people together, a lot of folks that are in this conversation, to try to help think through what it is and what it should look like. Um, building a new facility is about $600 million, um, and that's on the conservative side of an estimate. So as a policymaker, as a legislator who controls the purse strings, I don't want to commit $600 million just to rebuild the exact same thing we got, because um, I think that would be a failure. And I'm, I think it's a waste of your tax dollars to do that. We've got to be smarter and more strategic and really have a firm understanding of what the goals are that we want to accomplish with that. Um, we also need to be very thoughtful about um, who it is that that building would be serving. Um, when we know that um, a very large percentage of our incarcerated residents are there because of underlying mental health or substance abuse issues, uh, when we look at mental health and substance abuse from a public health perspective, rather than just a punitive uh, perspective, we I think we reached the conclusion there's other types of programs, facilities that might better serve those individuals. We also know that many, many people are incarcerated for very short periods of time. So incarceration, whether or not you think it's deserved, um, is very disruptive on people's lives, um, on their housing, on their jobs, on their family, on childcare. So when they don't have those connections to the outside world anymore, um, you, you run the higher risk for eviction, for losing a job, for not being able to provide, and then 
that in essence then continues and perpetuates a cycle that can lead towards more reoffense. Um, so at the same time that we're thinking about what the building or building should look like, we also have to pursue systems change. And um, it's a parallel approach that we're on. So we're always keeping public safety and health in front of minds, but we're trying to think about how you close the front door to the criminal justice wow. system uh, for those, those that are incarcerated and, and what other meaningful programmings we can do to prepare for them for reentry starting on day one. Um, very briefly on the question around, um, should we bring back our federal uh, our residents in, in federal uh, incarceration, federal inmates, 100%, absolutely. Um, and for those that are watching that don't, ha don't know uh, or haven't experienced incarceration, just imagine what it means to, to have somebody ripped away from their home, their family, job, their life, and they're sent hundreds of miles away, maybe thousands of miles away, yeah. uh, almost on constant lockdown. It's, it's not a recipe for success, it's a recipe for failure. So thank you so much for that, uh, council member, and for your leadership. I've been on lots of task forces and uh, you, the, what you bring to the table, what the Attorney General and his team bring to the table is real um, serious dialogue about these issues and I think it's really moving us forward. So I appreciate it. Um, before, before we go to Rob, um, I wanna go and uh, give his former attorney uh, a chance to, to share a few words. Uh, so, so Mr. Attorney General, if you could uh, share with us um, uh, before your, your former client uh, uh, presents his statement uh, in this court of public opinion. Um, your thoughts as we close this out and looking forward uh, from your perspective. Yeah, so um, my thought is, uh, first of all, that, you know, Rob Barton threw one heck of a panel discussion. Um, and I'm certainly hopeful that the over 100 people who are on this call um, have some follow-up that they want to make, and they can certainly reach out as Charles has invited folks uh, to Charles Allen's office, to my office, to any office that's represented or any of these incredible human beings uh, who are represented. I think it's really important, Mark, to go back to one of your opening comments, which is what does this time of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, this multi-generational, multi-racial, multi-geographic protest that's going on that really seeks at its, I think, most earnest to go at the issue of fairness, what that's all about and what does that mean for DC? I think what it means for DC is that just as Charles Allen has willingly taken body blows. I'm talking punches in the face from the Washington Post, okay? And other authorities for being bold in pronouncing DC values and being bold enough to really believe in the men and women of the District of Columbia and their right to come back and have a second chance. I think it means that, that Carl Racine, and I'll charge my office today, we've got to be bolder as well at this time. And so I'm looking forward to looking at the DC Charter that gives outsized authority to the United States Attorney's Office and look in a way to say, why can't we change what the definition of a child is? To just say, from a DC perspective, Definition of a child doesn't include 15, 16, 17 anymore. That's right. Uh, make somebody sue us. Um, and let's see if we can win in court on that. In other words, strip the federal government of the authority that they have right now because they're not going to give it away because they wake up one day and, and feel better. Um, yeah. So this has caused me and my office to think boldly about what we might do in our remaining time in office. And I'm looking forward to working with uh, some lawyers who are not in my office, the Public Defender Service lawyers on this. Fantastic. Well, we, we so appreciate your leadership, Carl, um, and your living DC values. And I think, you know, as we turn it over to Rob for a few comments, really his vision uh, for this evening and going forward uh, that he developed while he was at the jail, while he was a mentor, while he was 
a, a student in Georgetown University. And I don't think those things are an accident, right? right. That he was, he was working hard to improve others. He was improving himself. He was getting that opportunity. But his vision for tonight was that people who are incarcerated could join others in a community conversation in a community forum that would focus the public debate on the district and what we need to extend the movement of Black Lives Matter beyond the, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor into what's going on behind the walls, right? And so that was, that was his vision. I, I really appreciate uh, all the panelists and our guests for really um, making that vision come to reality. Um, as we started out, there's no, not a better example or a worse example of the situation we're in uh, to have Rob snatched that up uh, before he had a chance to participate. But, but he's, he's been here in spirit and now I'm really proud and, and thankful that we were able to have some communication with him while he was in Virginia, uh, that he could share a few words and uh, really lead us into the future. So with that, thanks to everyone and everyone stay on now uh, for a few minutes to hear hear from Rob Barton. Good to know everyone. I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. And I would especially like to give a huge thank you to my support team because without you, I would have never been able to accomplish something like this as a county and incarcerated individual. And I believe that this is what's so special about this event. It all spawned from the same dog about how to change the parole system in DC. And from there, I came up with the idea to start a petition and to keep doing this teaching. So as we have come full circle, it will be an understatement for me when I say that I'm so pissed that I was being there present today to see this through. But unfortunately, a week before the first scheduled day for this event, I was pissed away in the middle of the night and moving to a holdover facility in Warsaw, Virginia. Because this move, Things that we've been discussing all day. DC is not going to stay in the control of this criminal justice system. As if DC ever is worth sent hundreds and thousands of miles away to farm lands to serve their sentences, or if we had local control over our parole commission, that would be their present today. And then on my way back to Florida, seven because of the fact that bureaucracy mandates that. In order to have a remote hearing, a DTM, they must be in federal institution, even though they won't physically come to Florida. They will only use video calls to see me anyway. I can never remember the day I was tired of 16 and said, I'm going to be in jail and scared 16 16 year old child, even though trying psychology reports had already articulated that I was highly enforceable and sending me to jail when I help me, but will only make me worse. But there was no reverse transfer here where this report and other factors could be weighed by the court to ascertain whether or not I did in fact need to be charged as an adult, like it is done in other states. Instead, I was charged as an adult and sent over DC jail on a 10 or 17 year old juvenile in a bad house and to fit for myself. We didn't have to go to school. They didn't give us any books. They barely gave us recreation. We were left on the chair, locked up there, or from home, and two TV to fight over there. All my time was being locked up in over 14 different prisons. I have been sent to California, Illinois, Virginia, Florida, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, just to name a few. I have went years without sick of my family members because but the fact that I was too far away for them to afford to come to me. They have been warehoused in federal institutions for the past quarter of a century, but the jail is currently on lockdown. It's something I did last over six or bad for a year, and we are only allowed a 300 minutes a month, which has greatly strained my loved ones and my relationships. and forced to have to attempt to assimilate, to assimilate and to form rural cultures and forced to have to navigate these volatile environments from both prisons and staff are uh, combative towards and hate DC prison just because we are black in front of the city. And so, as a 41 year 
old man that not only had to do it, endure all of these things and fight to protect my safety and my sanity, now I have to go before the parole board who will expect me to have survived this hell and not come out burnt. They would use the determining factors of whether or not I've been charged as a juvenile several times, where I've been charged, how many times I've been committed, and what type of charge I got to determine whether they should let me go. They will also use my disciplinary history and my incarcerated to determine whether or not I'm ready to go home. But they would not take into consideration where they should have happened at or none of those things that mitigate facts. What I need them to know is who I am today and not what they see on me. I would also like them to understand the courage that it took to be warehoused with little to none rehabilitation. It's also offered to you and have to self rehabilitate yourself. Doing that, I have attained an associate's degree, several college credits from Georgetown Scholars Privilege Program. Read thousands of books on all types of subjects, earned a thousand certificates, and upon my return to DC, I had the pleasure of being a mentor on the YMB community at the DC jail, which showed me what real rehabilitation and incarceration should look like if we are served to Bob and our return to citizens to be able to successfully re enter society. We must begin to work towards changing some of these policies now. I start working towards this man and mass incarceration, which disproportionately affects African American men. And we must start having a more holistic and rehabilitative approach to incarceration rather than a warehouse and imperative. This is why I lost the initiatives for more than our crimes. I would use storytelling to tend to humanize incarcerated individuals and to advocate for serious offenders who have been locked up over death decades in prison, but while being rehabilitated, they have no chance of receiving a second chance when they just need to serve. So, what's so important that I want you to gather from this, and what do I want you to do? Please, go to our website and sign up. If you sign up and when you visit it, you can receive news and information on what you can do to advance reform, as well as more info on the issue that we talked about today. Please, please, please go to the website, stay involved, and engage with your election officials. As if we take action together, we can make different change. Thank you. to make this evening possible, having your team uh, focused on it. Um, you know, Rob directed us all. I, I'm, I just feel like I, I'll do whatever he tells me to do, <laughs> right? So he, he told us all to do something pretty easy. Um, go to the website. You can read his full story. You can hear about and see about his vision uh, of more than our crimes. Um, there's information there that breaks through the myths and the stereotypes that surround individuals like, like Rob and Roy um, and James, um, who were convicted of violent crimes, but obviously uh, have more than paid their, their, the, the price for that, right? If you want to talk about accountability, uh, they have been more than held accountable. Uh, and, and now the longer people stay away, uh, the, the, the more we're missing as a community, clearly assets. Every minute I think Rob is not with us in this community, uh, we are weaker for it. Uh, and so bringing folks home, doing what we have to to not have them go away uh, at all or as anywhere near as long as they go is, is, is what we need to do. Rob mentioned a, a petition uh, in his comments, that's on the website, that calls on the US Parole Commission uh, and others to take the first step. Uh, to have that transferred to local parole and not to make decisions based, as, as uh, James shared with us, simply on an offense that occurred 20, 30 years ago. 
so please go to the website, uh, sign it, uh, receive the updates, hear more about the issues that were uh, discussed today. You can go to Justice Policy's web website, the Campaign for Fair Sentencing of Youth and others, um, and really try to support uh, this movement going forward. Um, again, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining, for being a part of the, the discussion, and most importantly, I'll thank you in advance for going to Rob's website, honor his work, uh, and really let's, let's work together to continue this, this conversation and this effort uh, so that we can achieve real change. And uh, what the AG encourages us to do is be bold. And I think tonight was bold, uh, but we have to follow that with, with action. Good words, good conversation. Now we have to make sure that we honor Rob's uh, vision with action. So again, uh, thank you. And I think, um, I think that's it for this evening. So uh, appreciate everyone, appreciate our panelists and uh, hope everyone is, uh, remains safe and healthy uh, as we continue this, this fight for justice. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Peace.